Welcome to The Real Business of Wine, Focus on Brazil. And before going any further, I have to apologize. We had a lot of bandwidth problems this evening um, on this recording, and a lot of this, A, it doesn't look the way it normally does. It's broken up into, into squares the way that maybe you're used to seeing Zoom sessions uh, with family get-togethers, but not the way we normally do real business of wine and secondly the synchronization between uh, mouths moving and words uh, are not really working i apologize for that um, these were problems we had between brazil and where polly hammond was in spain and myself in the uk but we thought it's a very interesting session uh, we've looked at uh, brazil in the round and i'd like to apologize particularly um, to our speakers who actually we really struggled in um, getting online and particularly to Anderson Tilloni of Miolo, the export manager of Miolo Vineyards who was with us throughout the, the session but we didn't manage to get sound on until uh, really quite late on. But I think it's one of our more interesting sessions. I hope you enjoy it and, but I apologize for the technical um, hassles that we had to get over and a certain amount of editing that we had to do to make the, the whole piece um, hang together. But anyway, um, here we go. Welcome to the Focus on Brazil, which is one of the most exciting and perhaps least understood and talked about uh, wine uh, export regions. And I have to declare a small interest because um, I have not okay, been to Brazil found. for a very long time, but I actually did a book on um, the wines of the Americas way back in 1988-89, which went from Canada right the way down to Argentina and Chile. And I spent some time in Brazil doing a bit of research in both of the main regions then. And what I can say is there's a parallel between my trip to New Zealand about five years before, because I actually did, quote unquote, the New Zealand wine industry in about a week in 1985. And I did a lot of the Brazilian wine industry in, although there were two main regions, in about a week in 1989 in terms of the key players. And everything's changed. So today we've got um, on our panel, uh, Marcello Coppello, who I've known for a long time, who is, um, in terms of information on Brazil, he's the, the person I've gone to, a publisher uh, who really knows the market and other parts of, of, of South America as well, but particularly Brazil, and he is going to be basically our, our guide. But we also have Rodrigo Lenari of Wine Intelligence, and we had um, uh, Luli Halstead from Wine Intelligence on a couple of weeks ago in a fascinating session we had called uh, By the Numbers. Um, but Rodrigo has just very recently published the Wine Intelligence, Wine Intelligence Report on Brazil. Now, I suspect um, he's not going to give us all of the answers because I think they want to sell the, the report to for, for probably a fair amount of money. But I think that the key, some of the key findings and directions on that report, um, I think Rodrigo is going to, to give us. And I think we've got one or two other Brazilian guests who are going to join us. And um, I hope by the end of the, the hour, we'll have a, a clearer idea of Brazil, both as a country um, that is drinking wine um, and that is actually producing wine what is it buying, where from, um, what kind of wines, who's buying them, where are they buying. Um, I think I'm going to start with Marcello just as a, to give us a little bit of a, of, of a background to where Brazil came from. I think one of the things that, that I that surprised me, certainly, um, and Brazil, it, it actually put me in mind a little bit of Argentina, where Brazil, as a Portuguese-speaking country, although I, I, pref I have to say I prefer the, the, the sound of Brazilian Portuguese, certainly in music, to, to Portuguese Portuguese, but like American English. Um, but the Italian influence on wine in Brazil was something that I hadn't really understood until I went there, much as I um, discovered how strong it was in, in Argentina. Talk us through the history of, of, of wine in, in uh, Brazil and how did we get to where we are today and where are we today? Okay, Robert. Uh, first of all, thank you, Polly and Robert. It's an honor to be here <clears throat> with such nice people talking for, about our country. Uh, well, I can divide uh, briefly the history of wine in Brazil in, in maybe four uh, milestones. First, when the Portuguese arrived, they brought wine, and we always had some 
production and consumption of wine through history. Second milestone should be the arrival of the Italians in the uh, end of 19th century, 1890 about, and they established it in the south of Brazil. That's why we have the wine region in the south. Is it, it was a merit of, of history, not terroir, let's say. And we, we have these families in, that dominate the production of wine in Brazil are mostly Italians coming from Veneto. So that's why we had so many Italians and many Italian grapes. The third milestone, I should say, is in the 70s of 20th century, when the multinationals came to Brazil as uh, Pernod Ricard and, and Bacardi, and they uh, modernized the production. And we started to have a, a big production with more industri industrial view of production. And then lately uh, in the 90s, when uh, President Collor opened the imports of wine, and we had a lot of competition and the, the domestic market started to produce with much better quality. Uh, this is, uh, we can see today, Brazil has many, many more wineries producing with much more quality. And we have wines for, imported wines, maybe from 30 different countries. And this uh, last stage started in the 90s. So in the last 30 years, in, when, when I started working with wine 30 years ago, so in, briefly, this is Brazilian history in wine. And, and in, in, in terms of the regions, um, when I went but back in 80, 80, 80, 80, mm -hmm. 89, I went into across the, the border from Uruguay and visited what was then the Almaden winery, which is a very uh -huh. modern wine yes. at the time, making not particularly exciting wines, but, but wines that, that were commercially maybe interesting. And I then went back into Montevideo and I then flew north back to Sao Paulo. And then I drove or traveled to Bento Gonzalez, which is the only wine uh, city, wine town I've ever been to where you drive through a barrel, a, a, a concrete barrel to get into the town. Um, and I would, you know, it was, it was very new and exciting place. But what I discovered there was the climatic challenges. Um, and I've never been to the, the, the further north to Petrolinas where, you, where, you're, where wine mm -hmm. is being made twice, twice a year. Can you talk me through those, those three regions? What's happening and, where, and, and yes. anywhere else that wine is now being made? Well, uh, you, you mentioned um, Amadein. Today, this the big company uh, uh, belongs to Miolo Group, mm -hmm. uh, which is here represented by Anderson, who is ex export manager. Yeah, welcome, Anderson. Thank you, Anderson. And I can say, uh, until 10 years ago, 90% of the wines, nearly 100% of the wines produced in Brazil were in the south, uh, Rio Grande do Sul state, uh, mostly in Serra Gaúcha, and a little bit in the further uh, border of Uruguay. You, you mentioned Almaden. Today, uh, we have production of wine in almost every state in the country in, in uh, southeast, south uh, regions. Except from the north region, we have almost every state producing wine. And uh, in this production now is not 100% in Higuran Sul, it's 90% in Higuran Sul. Main region is still Higuran Sul. Second region is Santa Catarina. It's the second state from south to north in Brazil, near Higuran Sul. And third production is in, in Valle do San Francisco, you, you mentioned, parallel eight, mm -hmm. where we can have five crops every two years. So uh, about two crops a year. Very interesting place uh, with uh, mass production, but also now some better quality wines too. So that's an interesting thing. Now, I personally believed when I first heard about um, the, the Petrolinas project and, and tasted some of the wines, I thought it was potentially going to be a very interesting wine econom uh, region economically, uh, because if you can make two harvests a year. But everything I've heard since has raised questions over A, that the vines don't live as long. There are issues uh, involved. It doesn't seem to be the answer to everyone's problems that maybe some of the people thought it might be when um, those vines were first planted. Am I fair in that? You know, now after 30 years, they, they uh, learn how to manage the vines. Still the vines doesn't live as much as in, in Europe, uh, two, three decades only, but the production uh, reached a higher quality and the, the better 
best wines from the north are as good as the best wines from the south, I can say. Okay, that's very interesting. Now, um, so uh, why don't you give me a little bit of a picture of what your, of your, picture, of your wine intelligence view of um, Brazil today, leaping off from what Marcelo, Marcelo was saying. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us to talk about Brazil. Uh, our view of, of Brazil is that, uh, and this was the, the main subject of the last report we published, which is challenging times in Brazil. Uh, we see Brazil as a, as a land of, uh, at the same time, you have uh, huge opportunities. Uh, you have the sixth uh, uh, largest population in the world. Uh, you have a, an emerging economy, but still quite unstable. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when, we, when we look into the picture of how the wine market uh, is inside all this, uh, you see a market where you have extremes. You have consumers that are very high qualified, that uh, understand a lot about wine, well-traveled. And you have an, an enormous amount of people that are just uh, starting to, let's say, uh, uh, walk into this, this new world. Uh, so what we see in terms of Brazil is that uh, if I would compare uh, two countries, I would say we have uh, a huge offer, just like in the UK, where you can find wines from, from almost everywhere. And at the same time, you have huge dif uh, differences uh, among regions, right? So Marcelo was explaining us about the, the production. We, we produce wine in almost every region, uh, but the consumption in, in the market itself, it's, it's quite different from region to region. So I have been looking into this market for, for about less time than Marcelo, for about uh, 15 years now. And I have to say to you, it's quite complicated to understand about Brazil, even to ourselves. If you talk to skilled people in this market, they will tell you how difficult it is to understand. Uh, sorry if, if I'm, I'm changing subjects here, uh, Robert. But I'm just no going to, to put uh, some ideas here about this. Uh, it's how complicated it is to distribute wine in Brazil, to understand who is consuming wine and, uh, and where we are in terms of uh, the development of the market you know, how, how the market is, is behaving. And I just want to bring you like a figure. We, we did the, the report in March. Uh, we were just in the middle of, it was starting the pandemic. So Sao Paulo, we are a bit behind, right? So Sao Paulo was entering into lockdown and we were just, the, the interviews were already scheduled. So we had the picture of how the consumers were behaving at that time. And what we found out is that, uh, uh, most of the people were scared. Uh, even the were saying that they were consuming less wine, that they were not, uh, so they were uh, sort of uh, in panic mode. And uh, when we see the pictures, the, the, the import and national market figures for the first three months of the year, the market was growing at about 10%, you know, in volume. So it's very hard to, to read this market, right? You see a market that is developing and at the same time, a consumer that is saying that is consuming less and that is scary. So uh, if I can, I would like to, to put this uh, paradox, you know, uh, so that we, uh, we try to at least give a real picture of uh, what is going on now in Brazil and uh, how, how challenging this market can be. Now, can I just ask you, Rodrigo, one of the things that I know about Brazil, or I think I know about um, Brazil, is that it's a very young market. You've got a lot of, uh, compared to some other countries, um, maybe not compared to China, for example, you have a lot of young consumers, but you, it's, it's a country where you have a lot of younger consumers who are coming to wine uh, that maybe their parents didn't drink uh, as much of it, and they're coming to wine in a new way. And I'm, one of the things I hear is that it's a very fashion-driven market where um, almost a bit like the States in a way, people are looking for the new thing uh, compared to maybe the European model of you get somebody hooked into your region or your brand and with any luck, you can keep them for a few years. One of the things I'm, my impression in Brazil is, is people are very, looking, very much looking for the next thing all the time. Is that a fair, is that a fair view? 
That's right. That's right. I mean, it's uh, we can let, let's pick up an example: rosé wine, right? I mean, the the rosé trend it's going on for a long time now, but we can say that we we took some time to adopt it, but we we look very much in what is happening on uh, in Europe, in US, and in, in in the UK. So it's very fashion driven. At the same time, as you said, Robert, it's a very uh, young and immature market. Let me throw out another figure here. We, we asked people, have you consumed wine in the last month so that we can track down and, and, and bring this, this data together? And what we found out is that we have uh, a, a big amount of new drinkers. So people that are starting to drink wine or stating that they are drinking wine now. So the last figure we had of regular wine consumers were 32 million. In this last report, we had already 38 million. So there's 6 million of people that are starting to navigate uh, into wine. And my question is, uh, as an industry, are we ready to engage with these people? Are we talking the right language? Do we understand what they need in terms of, so, so it's a very young and, and fashion driven market, I would say. Can I move back to Marcelo? There's a question I'd like to look at you. When we talk to South Africa, for example, uh, there is, if you're either British or you're um, uh, Dutch, there is going to be a resonance to South African consumers in terms of words. And you can sell a Dutch, uh, or vi and vice versa. In other words, the, the, there's a linguistic link. Um, when we look at Angola, if we look at Macau, there is a Portuguese link. Um, if we're looking at uh, if we're looking at Brazil, how much does the Portuguese link work? today. I'm questioning it partly because of this younger generation of consumers. Are they as, um, as, as, as connected with uh, the, the, the European um, region from which Brazil got its language? Uh, or are they looking at other places? Well, if you belong to a Portuguese family or to an Italian family, sure, you, are, you tend to consume Portuguese and Italian wines. But besides that, Brazilians, uh, uh, you, you, you can divide here more as a social division than a cultural division. Uh, if you are trendy and you have a little bit of money to spend, uh, I think it's, it's, it's fancy to drink wine than to drink beer, for example. That's the, the trend here. But I, I wouldn't divide this by origin if you are from an Italian family or Portuguese family. This is more maybe at home with your parents. But uh, when and you go how, to buy wine, uh, sure. Okay, Robert. And one of the, the elephant in the room uh, of, it seems to me, of, of, in Brazil um, is Mercosur in the sense of the, of the if you like, the, 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 the um, single market uh, you have between the South American countries, which means that it's very, it, it's, it, if I'm making wine in Argentina or Chile, Brazil is a very attractive market for me to sell into and actually a, a Brazilian producer is actually competing with wines from those other countries, yeah, sometimes right. at a disadvantage in terms of his cost. Can you, can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, uh, we I, have I, an... Machado, you, you start and then Rodrigo, back to you in terms of what you've seen in the market. Okay, well, uh, uh, Mercosur agreement is very important here. We have Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and uh, uh, some of Chile, we have some, uh, percentages of wine of Chile we can have in Mercosur. And this affects a lot of Brazilian producers because the cost of production in Brazil is high, the styles of wine usually are not as attractive as uh, Chilean wines. Chile can put, and Argentina can put here wines of $2 that are very uh, easy to drink. That pleases a lot of Brazilian consumers. So there's a lot of complaint of Brazilian producers that there's uh, unequal competition. So there's a lobby, of course, in Brazilian production to uh, keep this taxation high. Here in Brazil, one of the main problems to the consumption to explode, to have a boom of consumption is price, of course. And the problem is taxation and bureaucracy. And of course, education also, but mainly Brazilians don't buy, don't, don't drink much more wine because of price. And when you look at the price points, uh, the more attractive wines are from Mercosul mainly Argentina, Chile, uh, and Uruguay. But that also no, raises a question. 
and, mm. and I'm going to throw this back to you, Rodrigo, in terms of the wines people are used to buying, um, if you take the traditional Portuguese model, for example, that would put, ideal in theory be related to regions. We'd be looking at Alentejo and Ribatejo and uh, Dao and so on. Um, if we're looking at uh, Chile and Argentina, we're looking at varietals. Um, so we're looking at Malbec and you get Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and so on. Um, is that relevant to the way that uh, particularly young uh, Brazilians are looking at wine? Are they looking at uh, grapes or are they looking at regions and, and indeed countries? Rodrigo. That's an interesting point that you are raising, Robert, because in terms of behavior, uh, what, we, what we strikes me about uh, uh, Brazilians is that they are considered as an open-minded consumer. So most of them, uh, three-fourths of Brazilians, say they are open to buy new styles and varieties of wine. So we can interpret that as, okay, they are probably discovering, they are on discovery mode, and also they are open-minded. Uh, so, uh, you, you, you mentioned about Portugal, so I have to agree that there is a strong cultural uh, aspect in Brazilians uh, embracing so well Portuguese wines. If you compare, for instance, Spain and Brazil is not as relevant as Portugal, and probably in terms of competitiveness, they are probably, uh, they, they can be at the same level, right? So there, there is a big uh, cultural factor. And Portugal, uh, so my answer to you is that uh, I, I think that most of the consumers, they are not much attached neither to grape varieties or, or regions. I think brand plays a big role on that. So safe brands that they know about and general region. So they talk about Chilean and Portuguese wines. Yes. So I would say that uh, country would, would play a, a, a bigger role rather than rather than region and even grape, right? So Portugal is doing really well in Brazil and uh, probably if you ask a regular wine consumer in Brazil to, 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 to give some examples of Portuguese grape varieties, they, they would know, I mean, the, the average consumer. So I would say brand and, and, and country of origin, they, they play a, a bigger role. I, I don't know if Marcelo agrees. Yes, I would like to add, usually the decision to buy wine is taken in the same day that wine is consumed. Uh, yeah, the, the big supermarket chain sells lots of wine on Fridays and people decide by price. So I want to drink a wine uh, in this weekend, today, tonight. I want to spend uh, 40 reais and I want it to be red. Then I choose by grape or country. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon or maybe it's Portugal because I, I have some uh, relate. I'm, I like Portuguese wines, but usually countries that they don't go down to region very rarely, I think. Um, and in terms of price, we, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, in dollars, what would what do you, what would the average price of a wine be, and what what is the kind of range of price? Well, uh, in the the big chains, Can I jump in on that? the average price oh, is sorry, two point nine dollars. So how much? Can you repeat that, please, Marcelo? In the, in the big chains, this is a research done by Nielsen Consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, the average price in dollars is $2.9. And of that, how much is tax? Uh, this is uh, about 40% tax, maybe. Mm -hmm. About. So uh, these are and mostly Brazilian non vinifera wines. Okay, and so if we go into uh, what we would call more quality wines, what would the price be? This would be about uh, 70 reais, which is uh, $14, let's say. This is a more on trade, but usually the, the price range that sells more is 50 to 80 reais, uh, 10 to $15, let's say. And Rodrigo, would you agree with those figures? Yes, one thing I would like to add, just for a matter of comparison, uh, is that, so tax is a little bit more, I would say the average tax on a bottle of wine in Brazil, depending if it's domestic or important, and where does it come from, ranges from 55 to 70 percent, okay, okay total yes. tax, depending on the wine, origin, yeah. and I'm including domestic wines on that. Mm -hmm. 
So and one thing one I would like the, to add so is go. that uh, wine in Brazil, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Go on, Rodrigo, please. Uh, yes, yes. One thing I would like to add is that, so when you look into retail prices in Brazil, a bottle of uh, imported wine, so we can compare in Brazil, costs uh, or the, the retail price is twice as much as in the US. Okay, so a wine that sells for $10.99 in the US would sell for approximately $20 in Brazil. So imported wine here is uh, extremely expensive. Uh, uh, and as Marcelo was saying, there is a, a price barrier of how much consumers can spend on wine, especially those days. So this will play a, a major role in, in terms of what types of wines consumers will be uh, buying uh, during these occasions of, of uh, consum consumption recession and so forth, right? Rodrigo, can I come back to you? Actually, again, there's a question that would be relevant to your research. If I take, um, there's a cultural question here. If I take countries like um, the Netherlands, uh, Britain, to a certain extent, South Africa, these are countries where even on a Saturday night, there's a ceiling on how much people are prepared to pay for wine. And it's, it, it's not that high a ceiling. If I look at the US, for example, the people will possibly buy a cheap wine on Wednesday, but they'll pay a lot more for a Saturday night, especially in, in New York. I'm talking about people who can afford it. Um, do people use wine as a, as a way to show off in, uh, in the main cities, the people who can afford to do it? Is it something that you, you show to your friends as you've spent a lot of money. I see that in Buenos Aires, for example, people will buy some very expensive bottles sometimes uh, as, as part of a, an image um, a process. How do you feel about that in, um, in Brazil? Absolutely, absolutely, Robert. I think uh, wine plays a big uh, social role in Brazil. When we talk about uh, uh, categories like champagne, like Barolo, like Brunello, you, you see uh, a, a certain recall of those uh, luxury wines among uh, high involved consumers. So I would say, socially speaking, wine plays a, a big role. And if I may jump into another subject, which is education, we, we see a rising number of people, uh, and Marcelo can, uh, certainly can, can, can give us, uh, can develop more on that, uh, uh, interest in learning more about wine. So the wine talk is, is, plays a social figure in Brazil. There are lots of affluent people that want to know a little bit more about wine. And uh, in this sense, we, we see, uh, anecdotally speaking, we, do, we have not done research on that, but uh, there is an, a growing number of uh, wine education courses in Brazil, and there is a growing interest of, uh, of, uh, of people into enrolling in these courses and knowing more about wine. So I would say yes, Brazil is, is very, uh, as you said before, the fa fashionable and, and also there is this social aspect of, of wine in Brazil. It's an important uh, aspect. Uh, and in terms of, one of the things we haven't talked about, you've mentioned rosé, which is of course a growing world trend. Sparkling wine, if I look at Brazil's exports, um, Sparkling tends to come to the, the, the front. There's a number, and that, that would in, uh, apply to Miolo, compared to other brands as well. Is that a focus of, uh, that, that's actually a growing focus in Brazil at the moment, uh, Marcello? Oh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> our domestic why? Yes, yes. In the production, our domestic production, uh, when we divide non vinifera and vinifera wines, in the vinifera wines, maybe 40% is uh, sparkling. And in the market share, uh, in the big chains, uh, sparkling uh, commercialization grew last year about 20%. So it's important. Sparkling wines are very important. And in the sparkling market in Brazil, 80% is domestic wine. So Brazil and how much of that? Not, uh, so I remember when Merton Chandon were when Chandon was in Brazil. They famously were calling it Champagne, but were making it uh, from Charmat, Cuve Close mm -hmm. at the time. Um, what is, how is uh, the sparkling wine made? How much is Champagne method, traditional method? How much is not? And how much is Moscato style? How much is Champagne wise? But Champagne wise is very important here. 
almost every a, a small produ producer uses Champagne Noise. They don't have scale to do Charmat. <clears throat> and is, so is sparkling wine a way of competing with the other, the, it's something that Brazil does well for Brazil in terms of competing against those uh, Argentine and Chilean imports? Yes, so uh, almost every Brazilian producer produces sparkling wine because they have market. So they can sell on the domestic market and if they have scale, they can, they can, they can export a little, export. Uh, I know Miolo is a, as a, as an independent company. Aurora is the biggest cooperative. Is it still the biggest cooperative? Yes, they export a lot of sparkling. Moscatel, Moscatel is very important in the domestic marketing and for exports. And Moscatel is very well suited in the south of Brazil. It is a very easy to drink wine. And the Moscatels from here are, have quality for exports and have price. So it's a perfect product for exports. I'd like Aurora to ask... Um, Anderson, as I said, Anderson's had some problems in sound. I hope we can have him now um, actually telling us a little bit about Miolo as a company because it has been a very dynamic company within, um, within the Brazilian industry. Anderson, can we hear you? Can I jump in about sparkling a little bit? Just, uh, uh, yeah, if I can just if, see if, if I may add something. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sure. Well, just uh, in the meantime, uh, we, we are tracking, when, when you talk about uh, repertoire, uh, we see that a growing number of consumers, they mentioned that they are drinking, we, we have a, a category called sparkling wine from Brazil. And sparkling mm -hmm. wine from Brazil is among the top five uh, most uh, mentioned uh, categories when we ask uh, regular wine consumers. So I would say sparkling has an important role also in attracting uh, new consumers to wine because of this uh, of a larger uh, re uh, occasion, you know, possibilities for celebration, for parties, and also why not uh, to engage with uh, younger consumers. Uh, we see in Brazil, uh, there is this, oh, sorry, Robert, you wanna? I'm just gonna, hoping, I hope that Anderson can actually uh, go, actually give us a few words about, about uh, Miolo. Uh, sure. so we have some problems with sound with and connection with Anderson, but I um, hope he can hear me. Anderson. Well, what I was saying just uh, hold on, hold on, Rodrigo, and hold I will on, wrap up with that. Oh, sorry. Okay, sure. If we can, I'll just wait see if we can hear him. I think maybe. Okay, Rodrigo, carry on. Sorry, we still have that problem of connection with Anderson. Please, Rodrigo, carry on, wrap up what you were saying. We are discussing Rodrigo? about sparkling. One yes. of the, the yes. things that we, yes, one of the things that we, I was, I was saying about the role of, that sparkling is, is growing on consumers' minds, sparkling wines from Brazil, uh, that the industry is also putting more efforts, not just in selling uh, or in selling the image of sparkling wines in Brazil abroad, but also inside the country. And that sparkling has an important role in attracting uh, new consumers and also the young generation. One thing that we have been tracking, Robert, is that, uh, and this is a challenge for Brazil, is that the young generation, the 18 to 25 years old in Brazil, have not yet embraced the category. So there is a low penetration uh, if I can give you a figure, like about 18 to 20 percent of the of Brazilians are uh, aged in that group, and we have just a penetration of 11, 12 percent, so of of people that say that they drink wine. So we see that young people in Brazil have not yet uh, embraced wine, so to say. So can I just ask, and I'm really sorry, Anderson Teloni from Miolo is trying to get in, and I'm, we're having a real problem of connections with him, but. Um, the, just bringing back that question you've just talked about, because young people not drinking wine is, is a global uh, issue at the moment. But in a sense, you have these other drinks, that there's, a, there's a repertoire of drinks. Where are young, the, the people who might be drinking wine and the people who indeed are drinking, beginning to drink wine, are they drinking wine with food or are they drinking wine as a beverage? Uh, alongside friends for drinking beer and drinking other 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 beverages where does it fit into their into their repertoire 
I, I think um, wine in Brazil st still is very much related to ritual, so to food or to celebration. It's not an everyday drink. Also, uh, it's very rare to find wines. Uh, let's say I was talking about young people. So in, 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 in parties or night outs, people drink mostly uh, spirits and beer in these occasions. And uh, the reason for that is that people are still afraid, you know, to choose or as we were saying before, not to show off the wrong product, right? So if we pick up other categories like, uh, like spirits or you have the big brand, so people are feel confident about buying these brands and this does not happen with wine yet. So I would say, generally speaking, wine is still very much food related and very much ritual related, so to say, for celebration, so, for special occasion. Yes. So Marcello, could, could, could we, in terms of what we're seeing in the US, not that far away, there has been this growth in mm -hmm. uh, wine in cans um, and also other smaller formats in particular. Um, is that something that we can see, I can imagine that working well with a younger audience in Brazil but obviously it, it doesn't fit into that history of ritual. Is that coming? Is it, are you seeing it coming? Yes, we have already some two, three brands of uh, wine and can, maybe more, and very successful. And where are oh. we selling, in terms of the breakdown between the on-premise and off-premise, how much is being sold uh, in um, the on-premise in restaurants and cafes and bars compared to... Uh, the, the, the retail, the consumer at home market. Uh, the, the main channel to sell wine in Brazil is uh, before pandemic and now still the big supermarket chains. Before pandemic, I would say 60 to 70% were the biggest supermarket chains. I just made a research, uh, a survey with 1000 followers of my social media and they are buying 35% in the chains. Then um, Oreca, before the pandemic, 20%, now nearly zero. E-commerce, before the pandemic, 10 to 15%, now about 35% uh, in, my, in my survey. And <clears throat> now in, in the, the pandemic, one very important channel is WhatsApp. Lots of people selling wine through WhatsApp. Big importers or people uh, bringing wine illegally. Uh, everyone is selling wine in, uh, in WhatsApp in small scale, let's say. But in my survey, this responded to over 20% of the sales. So that's a lot. And then- And how the, much in, in to, go, go on. 10% sold in delis, in small specialized uh, stores. So globally, the, the thing that everybody's talking about is direct to consumer. Um, and that's the, the, going to be the growth. And particularly as people are worried about the restaurant sector not necessarily picking up uh, to where it was. Um, do you see that being something that's going to happen more in, in Brazil? Marcello? Well, right now, uh, the, the Oreca channel is in big trouble. It's almost zero, the commercialization of wine in this, in this channel. And lots of small importers and small producers sell uh, as the main channel in, the, in restaurants. And many of the restaurants I know are not, are not reopening after the pandemic. They are really uh, closed activities. So this will be the most difficult uh, channel to recover after the pandemic. So, so do you think there will be a, a growth in direct consumer from people, from companies and producers um, who have been um, uh, selling to restaurants? Um, yes, I think so. Okay, I've got a question actually from somebody in the audience, Andrew Halliwell, who's based um, in Spain. What kind of wine is selling in cans? It's uh, Benifera wines. Yeah. We have uh, white, red, yeah. sparkling, uh, Moscatel, uh, the same company that sells wines also sell uh, cocktails in cans. So we have uh, uh, some good wines in cans. The quality is quite acceptable, quite good. So back to this question, I think we keep coming back to that issue of vinifera, non-vinifera. 
how much is non vinifera it's about uh, i i tell you the, the the numbers we have uh 300 million liters production of wine in brazil and 250 about it non vinifera and is that something that we're going to see change do you see is there a because um, we did a session a very interesting session uh, a couple of weeks ago called the grapes in which we had we were looking at the northeast of the us and the, and the, actually the there's a revival in fact of interest in uh, hybrids and um, la brusca is that something are people taking these grapes seriously or are they doing it because they've always done it Yes, the, the, the trend we, I've seen in the last years is this uh, production won't go down. They will still be important, very, very important and in long term to the Brazilian industry. The thing is they are selling these uh, wines in smaller bottles as a fine wine bottle. Sometimes uh, uh, as natural wines or more terroir wines also. So uh, there are some boutique wineries producing non vinifera wines like this. And Rodrigo, do you see in terms of the future, um, in terms of your predictions as, as wine intelligence, do you see that being a, a change in the styles of wines being produced and consumed within uh, Brazil? Uh, what we see nowadays in terms of, of styles of wine that are being produced uh, and consumed in Brazil, uh, the approachable style, so very uh, fruit-driven, rounded wines. It's very common when you ask consumer about preferences, they usually say, I do not like, uh, uh, how do you say that, medium oh. sweet wine. I like dry wine, but most of the time, uh, when you present a style of wine that is fruit and oh. a bit sweet, uh, uh, the average consumer, I would say, you're, you are in charge of um, marketing for, for um, Miolo, or what, what's, your, what's your role? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually the sport manager for Miolo. And, and what sort of styles, because I've seen your wines in, in other countries, what sort of wines are you actually selling outside Brazil from Miolo? Right, so uh, we are presenting around 30 countries right now. Uh, so our, our main presence nowadays is in the UK. And then it comes China, uh, third USA. And then we have some very favorite countries in each continent that we, are, uh, that we have a presence. Like we, we use as pillars uh, these three countries in, this three, in, the, in the three continents. Uh, we also now are starting uh, to finally put our feet in Africa with Nigeria this year. So first uh, containers are arriving right now uh, in the middle of May. Uh, this week, actually, um, and, so, and we mainly it, de it depends on the country, but uh, it mainly for UK, for example, it's white wine, dry white wine. It's a blend of Pinot Grigio and Riesling. In China, mainly uh, red wine, a more uh, intense uh, red wine, like uh, bold, structured, uh, and more and more expensive. Uh, because the importer, they, they position the brand in a high standard in China, as you, as you may know, they have this different uh, consumption, consumption uh, classes, you know, high levels of, different levels of consumption. And we are, we are, we are very well uh, positioned in China in terms of price. So mainly higher price wines and red wine. And in USA, it goes pretty much of everything. It's a big consumption uh, country. Uh, so sparkling wine, especially rosé, dry sparkling wine, uh, but also then we can have from our most expensive wine to the, the to the cheapest ones, and all of them sell very well. Okay, it depends so on the channel that you are into, also. Could I interrupt? So in a sense, um, yeah. are you um, in terms of the the volume of production that that you that Miola does? How much do you actually produce, and how much is exported at the moment? So currently, we are producing at around 15 million bottles per year, 15 million liters per year. Sorry, and we export. Uh, we 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 don't actually sell all of that all of that a year, but in terms of commercialization, we are at around seven to eight percent of the of the total selling in, in Brazil in vol in terms of volume, not not in terms of money, because when we sell in Brazil, we have all the taxes that uh, that you pay in Brazil, and you export at zero tax. 
So I would say in terms of volume, it's around 8%. In terms of uh, money, it would be around 5%, I would say, or less. And I've got questions from one or two people, one from Annette Lizotte from what is the interest for organic, biodynamic and natural wines? And I'm also interested in that regionally because some parts of Brazil are easier, I think, to produce, to grow wines organically because of disease issues than others, but maybe I'm, I'm unfair about that. Uh, and Anderson, would you like to address that? Yes, Anderson, in terms of interest in organic, are you doing organic, sustainable, biodynamic, uh, any of those? Are you into those sort of categories? Right. We we actually do not. Uh, it's, it's quite expensive to produce organic wine in Brazil due to our climate conditions. Uh, we just launched a, a, a game, a game uh, varietal with uh, wild fermentation and SO2 free, uh, but 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 not not organic or biodynamic. We're not uh, still not into that kind of production yet. Marcelo, have you are you seeing smaller producers? Uh, moving into those directions. And if I were in Sao Paulo or Rio, would I go into wine bars today and see um, a list of, of natural wines on, on wine lists in bars yet? Yeah, in Clem, yes, <clears throat> it is possible, especially in Sao Paulo. In Rio also, wines more connected to terroir, less, less intervention. You can find that mostly in Sao Paulo, then a little bit in Rio. And we have maybe about 30 producers from garage to small ones, making uh, wines in this direction. So are we, saying orange, are we saying skin contact, orange wines? Yes, also, are we, also some, yeah. we have some. And, and is that helping to um, actually create more of a buzz about wine alongside? We haven't talked about, and, and beer is obviously a very big market in Brazil. Um, is there a, a, any parallel between craft beer and craft wine? Do they come to? Do they work together at all? Oh yes, we have a, even a, a recent case of a, a guy who is producing uh, craft beer, who is going to craft wine, and he's he's launching wine in, on tap also. And what about in terms of restrictions, in terms of marketing, advertising, and so on? Uh, are there are there restrictions on what you can do and what you can't do? And the, the drinking, what's the drinking age? Eighteen. 18. And, and can, I, can I sponsor, and, and obviously, in, for example, in France, there's a very clear limit on what you can and can't do, similarly in other countries, India and Russia and so on. Um, is there freedom in terms of, of, of promotion? I think so. Uh, Rodrigo, we have, do we have uh, some, any, any law for, against that? I'm not sure. I don't think so, because we have lots of companies supporting this. I would say we are average strict in terms of law. So in publicity... Uh, we have certain times of the day that you can publicize on, on TV or you have to put legal statements. Yeah, I mean, sponsoring there is events, a big, yeah. uh, uh, is sponsoring events, not much. Uh, we have, uh, of course, restriction with uh, drinking and driving, which has played a yeah. big uh, role, I think, uh, some years ago of consumption at own trade and but I would say we are average strict in terms of uh, communication and alcohol. And just jumping on that, you know, uh, there was a, one of the largest newspapers in Brazil, Folha de São Paulo, just published an editorial talking about uh, wine, uh, not wine, sorry, alcohol moderation during pandemic. And they were giving their, their vision about, which is, which is certainly happening in many parts, which is people are locked down, they are at home, so they are drinking more. And uh, there is a growing concern about, uh, uh, about the consequences of, of that. So, so I would say, oh, yes, I just uh, made yes there is some, some, some concern on that side. Mm -hmm. So I'm told that I'm just seeing something from here saying that um, you can't sell glass bottles at the beach. Um, and so that's a, I, I think that's not unique to, um, to Brazil, but it's something that I can see happening elsewhere. But a question from Cristiano Borba. Uh, what do you expect for next year of the Brazilian wine market, considering the uh, current exchange rate of the real against uh, the dollar? So I think that's obviously a sort of question that also applies for Argentina quite often and indeed South Africa. Um, that's obviously relevant both to exports and to the uh, domestic market. Um, Anderson, Anderson, go ahead. In terms of exports, I would say 
Uh, it might help pr Brazilian producers a bit, but uh, there's something very important, uh, say it's more important than pricing, actually, as the name of Brazil abroad. So something very important that we, we need to work on uh, institutionally, all the wineries together, is the Brazil name, Brazil brand uh, in the main countries of consumption. So it might help us on pricing, but until there is not a, an actual demand from the consumers uh, to our product, I wouldn't say that we help us increase a lot the, a lot the exports. But, okay, but looking at it the other way in terms of imports, um, if, if you're actually um, paying in dollars, uh, what, how does that affect you um, in terms of, of what's going to be sold in the market? Um, Marcelo, do you, you want to chip in there? Yes, I, I would say, of course, it's a, it's a big problem. But now we have a dollar very high, maybe 30% higher than it was in the beginning of the year. And still importers are buying in wine because the demand is high. People are drinking really much more during uh, isolation. And in mid long term, I would say this will affect prices, but not consumption. We had a very severe crisis in 2014 and uh, we had uh, a trade down people uh, uh, spending less money, but still consuming more wine. I think this will be in this direction that changes. And without getting too heavily into politics, how does the Bolsonaro uh, government uh, relate to the wine industry in Brazil? Does anybody want to answer that? <laughs> um, I can make a little comment about that. Alison, Anderson, go ahead. It's actually gover this government, besides all the problems that might seem to be, uh, it's, been, it's been really close to the, produ to the producers. We've achieved some, uh, some, I would say, some uh, new rules on taxes, like state taxes related, uh, that change it since the, since the beginning of this government, that we would not achieve in previous governments. And they, are, they, they, they have been here, they have been to the winery, uh, the Miolo family has a, a has a close relationship with some people in this government, with Bolsonaro as well. And uh, as I said before, all the problems that our politics have or seem to have, uh, I see that they are they are they are listening to the producers. Something that we had some difficult in in previous governments. And uh, for us in Brazil, is really making a difference. Uh, Miolo is is, is uh, Yolo is achieving some growth in the Brazilian market due to this, uh, this kind of this, 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 uh, different regulations on taxes that are happening through, uh, through, through the new government, like the, the state taxes they call the substitution tributaria. I don't know how to say that in English. It's another one, as another tax on, uh, on all our heavy, uh, heavy chain of taxes that we have in Brazil that are falling in some states and that's, that's been helping us uh, gain some markets in, in some states. Thank, thank you. Uh, one question as well, we're on, um, in terms of Miolo and in terms of the industry, so how important is uh, wine tourism, um, how, how important has the wine tourism been to you as, uh, in terms of um, building your market? That's really important for us. Uh, for you to have an idea, we have four wineries spread in the in four different regions of Brazil. So two are in the Campania region, one is called Campania South Campania, or Campania Meridional, Campania Central. Uh, Campania Central. Uh, in this region, we have around 600 hectares of own vineyards. In Serra Gaúcha, where, where we have the Valle dos Vinhedos denomination of, of origin, the Miolo Winery, it's 120 hectares of land. And in northeast of Brazil, in the state of Bahia, in the Valle do São Francisco region, we have the Terra Nova Winery with more 200 hectares of own vineyards in this region. So how many tourists in would the, you see in the, across those wineries? In the Miolo Winery, we receive at around 300,000 tourists a year. That's a, that's a lot uh, of people. Turnover for, for this region just with our uh, tourism, uh, tourists. It uh, mm -hmm. corresponds to one region of Brazil like Thank south you. region of Brazil or southeast region of Brazil, just with tourism. So it's really, really important for the winery to keep on with the tourism. 
Thank you, Anderson. Marcello, do you see wine tourism, and we're very close to, to wrapping up the, the session, but do you think see wine tourism as being uh, an important future uh, element of, of uh, growth for the industry, both in terms of direct consumer sales, but also in building consumption in Brazil? Yes, very much. Uh, uh, vale dos Vinhedos is very attractive. Lots of people go there. It's the kind of first wine trip they make. And also very, very important is Brazilians traveling abroad. Brazilians spend lots of money, billions of dollars every year in traveling. And every Brazilian that goes to wine region brings lots of bottles in, lots of bottles in. Wines are expensive in Brazil with taxation. So uh, it's typical. You travel, you buy uh, six bottles and you pay the trip. That, that breaks, actually, I have a quick question from Evandro Fio. Um, how did the agreements between Mercosul and the European Union change the dynamics of the wine market in Brazil? And is that going to lead to an increase of European wines in the market? Do you have any feeling on that? Marcelo? I think so, change. if I can jump in. I believe yes. so, yes. Yes, it might change. Uh, I mean, it will bring a, a more diversified offer. If we pick up nowadays, just one country, Chile, makes, I mean, in terms of imported wine, 40, 45% of the market. So certainly the offer will expand, right? And also it will open the market for exports, uh, for, for, for our exporting industry. So I think this is very, very positive for the, for the industry, just also in terms of imports and exports, you know, as it opens also the markets for, for Brazil in Europe. And so we haven't mentioned French, French wines, but French wines have historically not performed necessarily quite as well in Brazil as they might have hoped. Does that mean we might see more in, in Brazil? Anyone? Uh, yes, I would say so. With, with, with Mercosul, I would say so. I would say so. Fr French wines, they have a very good image in Brazil. Old world wines like France, Italy, they have a very good image. And uh, if, it, if they can reach the market at a good price point, I would say uh, they will be certainly more successful than they are now. Right? I, so I have I to say ask... In terms of Europe, imports, the wines that are doing better are... Portugal wines, yes, sorry. So, so I'd have to ask that Go. question. So in terms of an X seller price out of Europe, can you work that back in terms of, are we talking about wines that leave Europe at, at let's say three or $4 or are we think, do we think there's a promise of, of, of wines leaving at, at eight or $9? Where is the sweet spot, do you think, for wines from Europe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any ideas? I would say that the sweet spot for sweet spot for fine wine in Brazil uh, would be from, I would say from three, 3.5 to six euros. That's the sweet spot where, where fine Ex wine is. Excellent. So it can arrive at, at shelf is at a, exactly, three to six dollars. When you say about six, 10, 10 euros, I would say it, it will be then already luxury, you know, uh, wines. Yes. Um, Polly, do you have any questions? You usually got a marketing question or two up your sleeve. Um, if you've got one, I know Polly's had some problems on uh, connection as well this evening. I, I've tried to stay quiet in the background because we had so many bandwidth connections. So yes. forgive me, everybody. Um, actually, I would just like, I do always have a marketing question. I would like for anyone, um, perhaps Anderson, you might be best to discuss this, to, to talk to us a little bit about um, we about direct to consumer and about digital and about e-commerce and about selling platforms and specifically how has that changed through the course of the past three months? We change a lot. In Brazil, we have seen an increase of 62% uh, on e-commerce compared to last year. Also, we've been working a lot uh, more uh, wide with uh, digital platforms, with social media, and also abroad, um, we, we, we're actually suffering uh, since the lockdown in China, since it's our uh, second market for exports. Right now, they're starting to open, open again, but since they started closing the, the restaurants, we didn't sell one container for China because uh, we depend heavily on restaurants. Uh, same in UK, not so much in USA, but uh, two, of our, two of our main markets, in, in two of our main markets, we are, re we are really dependent in, uh, of the entree, of the RECA um, uh, sec sec sector. 
So we've seen moves from the importers as well to start uh, working more closely, not just with Italian, French, and uh, Spanish or whatever they have in the portfolio, but Brazilian wine. That that for them before it was more so it was something more like a a niche product for like a Brazilian restaurant or some specialized chains, and now they are working closely with other other ways of uh, distribution, uh, digital um, delivery, uh, and, 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 and in their social medias as well with Brazilian wine. So it has, it, it did have changed a lot, it had changed a lot in the uh, last three months. And uh, I think that's gonna be a big help for not just Miolo, but Brazilian producers due to this uh, change of behavior of the importers as well. So following up on something you said earlier, um, the brand, Brazil wine, uh, do you feel like that there are champions currently leading the way on that? Are there lessons that we can learn uh, or take away in either direction about how to improve that brand placement worldwide and what the strengths are? Yeah, I would say Argentina is a big example for us because, they, because when they started working on their brand, uh, people people used to know just about Chile, and uh, they didn't know a lot about Argentina. And they, they worked at it. They worked the brands with wines or of, uh, wines of Argentina very well and very intensely. And right now they're very known and, and known about quality products, not just about being a cheap wine. So yeah, I would say Argentina is a it's a it's a good example for us to follow. Can I just chip for our neighbors? Could I chip in there? Because what you've had in Chile, you've had Cabernet Sauvignon as a very successful grape for a long time, and you've had Conchi Toro and a few other very strong brands. Exactly. In Argentina, you haven't had as many strong brands. Obviously, Catena we had here uh, a few weeks ago, and there are a number. Of, there are a few, but it's been Malbec uh, essentially that has driven the Argentine story. Uruguay is much smaller. Tanat is what they're trying to, to push. What is Brazil's strength? What is your USP? What, what do you say to the world? And I can see much earlier you smiling and I think you want to say something, I'm sure, in a second. Rodrigo, you may have some thoughts on this, but Anderson, what, when you're trying to sell Miolo wines and brand Brazil, what uh, is the flag that you're flying? Um, for your country? Well, uh, Brazil produces, uh, of course, it's not, a, it's not a speech that we must have be in front of the world. But Brazil, Brazil, Brazil produces a lot of different profiles of product in very good quality. But um, the speech that we have prepared for the world is a sparkling wine. So wines of Brazil is, uh, have everything prepared to work Brazil as a leading producer and quality producer of a sparkling wine. It's either traditional, either Sharma method is our, our sparkling wine. We have a very strong history uh, background with, with sparkling wine. Um, we can produce very good quality in all the regions, Campania, Valle dos Vinhedos, in Northeast of Brazil. Miolo is producing outstanding sparkling wine, very tropical style in, in, in Bahia, in Valle de San Francisco, we produce amazing traditional method in in Valle dos Vinhedos. So uh, I always say it's very difficult for you to make bad sparkling wine in Brazil. Thank you, I understand. Marcelo, would you, would you agree that sparkling wine is going to be, um, because England thinks that sparkling wine is its uh, future, um, and there are a few other places that are also trying to fight in that, in that, yes, that as, region. As a point, yes. Uh, sparkling wine as, as, as marketing as a flagship, yes, to start. But then Brazil produces very interesting red wines, white wines, orange wines, rosés, everything you can imagine. But uh, to, to gain consumers and to attract attention, I think it's a sparkling wine right now. Um, and uh, Rodrigo, do you want to chip in anything there in terms of the, the, the domestic market view? Do, do you think that the Brazilians think of sparkling wine as their top style? I agree with both. I just disagree in the sense that we, this is not a consensus within the industry. So I agree that you have to find a flagship, you know, to differentiate yourself. But nowadays, uh, we don't see everyone moving 
in the same direction in terms of uh, promoting, publicizing, communicating Brazilian sparkling. So I, I agree with both that uh, the flagship has to be sparkling, yes. Um, I think we're about seven minutes over. I know we've had various problems of connections here and I'm really glad that we've, we've managed to get through them. I'm sorry, Anderson, you had problems early on. That's okay. Can I say thank you to Marcelo um, again for uh, really helping to, to put this together and to bring us a lot of information. Rodrigo uh, from Wine Intelligence, thank you for your insights you. on your report. Anderson from Miolo, thank you uh, very much for, for what you've been sharing with us. And indeed, thank you to everybody in the audience who's been very patient, as Polly's just said, for some of the glitches we've had. We've had this is our 31st or 32nd second, and it's actually probably be one of the trickiest we've had between all of us in terms of, of connections. Funny if I thought mine was going to be bad, um, but actually it was actually um, better than I thought it was going to be. So finally, thank you to everybody for being here. Please come back. We've got all sorts of other really great sessions coming up. Watch this on YouTube, watch the other sessions we have on YouTube and subscribe there. But thank you very much, all of you, for taking part. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bonnie. Bye. Thank you all.